Hello, everyone. And, uh, you know, it is my great pleasure today introducing Lawrence van der Martin. Lawrence, I'm, am I close? Good enough. Yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> okay. So the research director at Facebook AI Research, and uh, he's, uh, he's interested also, of course, focus on machine learning and computer vision. But more important than that, Lawrence is the author of um, very important algorithms that most of us here, you know, in the audience, we cannot escape, we cannot avoid using, especially the ones who are working on single cell sequencing right now. Um, so uh, the, uh, which, which algorithm is that? It's called the uh, Disney algorithm, which is stand for T stochastic uh, neighbor embedding. So uh, the, I, I think the, um, the, the, the algorithms actually has the name back in 2003, uh, which has named stochastic neighbor embedding from, I think from uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Sam uh, Rowis. Uh, but the uh, the problem with, of course, that the the SNE algorithm is a great algorithm. But the problem with that, there's a problem with that, is the grounding problem. And I think Lawrence in 2008 made a great contributions. Why he, uh, in, instead of he 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 came into the game and he used the T distributions, with has a wider tail. Um, of course, we can talk a lot about uh, his uh, research, but the the problem with uh, with the field is that you know people has been using BCA and then DSNE and then then we have UMAP and then we are going to have a series of of new algorithms that try to reduce the dimension from high dimensional space to something that human can interpret in 2D or 3D. But the problem with this algorithm is that, you know, they're very technical and it's quite difficult to understand. And, you know, uh, in 2010, uh, I, I think we overlap. Uh, I overlap with Lawrence at uh, some, some time at UCSD and had a chance to um, attend some of his talk about the uh, Disney algorithm. And Lawrence was, I, I, what I recognized was Lawrence was a, is a fantastic speaker that he can speak about mathematics without even mention about mathematics or any formula. And because of that, I would like to um, invite Lawrence to speak to, uh, you know, hundreds of biomedical scientists and biologists. And also we also have uh, computer scientists joining this seminar. So uh, I think this is a challenge and um, I give the stage back to Lawrence to share about the, uh, the, the TSNE algorithm. And yeah, so if you have questions so um, we, the talk will be in one hour. The seminar will be in one hour. And we, uh, the talk will be in 45 minutes. And we have 15 minutes left for questions. But, you know, in, in computational seminar, usually the, you can, uh, we can ask questions anytime. Uh, Lawrence, are you OK with that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I have the um, the little Q and A box open. So if you ask questions there, I'll I'll try to answer them as we go. Um, I guess it'll depend a little bit on how many questions come up. Uh, okay. But uh, but yeah, we'll see. I'm sure there will, there will be a lot of questions, Lawrence. All right. Cool. Okay. So now this is yours. Cool. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Yeah. Thanks so much for um, for the kind introduction. I guess with this introduction, I think. The rest of the webinar can can only disappoint. Um, so um, so I'm presenting you know work on um, on TSNE. This was joint work with uh, Jeff Hinton um, at the University of Toronto that I did uh, during my PhD. And what I'll try to do in this webinar is sort of three things. 
Um, I, tr I will try to give you a bit of a flavor for how TSNE works. Um, I, will, I will give you some examples of the kinds of visualizations that you can create using, um, using TSNE. So, so how, to, um, how to use the algorithm in, in, in practice. And I'll go a little bit into what are some things that you need to be careful about when you're, um, when you're using TSNE. So it's kind of like an introduction and then you know, do's and don'ts of, um, of using the algorithm. Um, so, so let's f start with sort of a quick introduction, right? So, so what is this algorithm about? The, the, the basic setup is that we assume we're given a set of high dimensional data points and I'll write these data points as um, X's, right? So they're uh, capital N of these, uh, these data points. Um, and you know, these are high dimensional uh, vectors in some space, right? So for instance, if you collect gene expression data, they could be, um, you know, the expression values. Um, and so like the vector would be something like, you know, 20,000 um, uh, would have 20,000 values in it, presuming that your, your sequence isn't around uh, 20,000 genes. And so you've, you've collected a whole bunch of these, um, these measurements. And now the, the, the problem that you have is you want to get a sense for what this data looks like. Right, where you know looks like it's a little bit um, a little bit fake, I guess. But but you you know you want to try and understand like is there some structure in this data that is um, that is interesting and that I can sort of you know investigate further. And in order to do this, um, a common approach is to try and build a map of the data in a two or three dimensional space, and then to show that map as as a scatter plot. And I'm showing an example of that here. Um, so the, the most common method for, for doing this is probably principal component analysis or, or PCA. And this is an example of, um, of a typical PCA visualization that, that is obtained this way. So the underlying data here is very simple. There are these, um, these images of, um, of handwritten digits. And so basically each X is a handwritten digit. Um, and the, the values inside each X, inside each high dimensional data points are really just the pixel values, right? So sort of the, the intensity um, uh, values of the pixels, right? And so what I did in this, in this quick experiment is I ran PCA on a couple of thousand of these digit images, just treating them as, as high dimensional data points. And then uh, I obtained the following uh, visualization. So in this map, um, each point corresponds to um, a single digit image. And I've colored the points according to the digit that the image represents. Um, so for instance, the, the red dots on the left, um, those are images of zeros and the orange dots on the right are images of ones. And so what you see, this is um, that horizontal direction is the first principal component. And what you see is that the first principal com component is basically capturing this difference between zeros and ones, which sounds maybe a little bit weird, right? Like, but if you think about digits in terms of sort of overlapping pixel values, right? Then zeros are very different from ones, right? And so that is sort of the maximum source of, um, of variation, right? The, um, the vertical direction, um, so basically what you see there is on the top, you see four sevens and nines. Um, and on the bottom, you see threes, fives, and eights. So those are sort of two groups of, um, of digits that are a little bit uh, similar visually, right? And so that's the, what the second principal component is, um, is picking up on. Now, this is great. This is a very yeah, you know, interesting visualization, uh, but really the only reason you can make sense of it is because I gave you the colors. If you didn't know sort of the, you know, what the classes were, sort of what your, your data was, then your scatter plot would look something like this. And it would be really hard to, to make sense of, right? You could maybe see a little bit that there's some like high density area on the bottom right, uh, but really it just looks like a blob of points and, and you don't really know what to do. And so PCA isn't very well suited for these kinds of visualization applications. And the reason for that is, um, is sort of twofold. First of all, PCA learns a linear mapping of, um, of the original high dimensional data. And this is really uh, restrictive. This is really restricting sort of what, um, what PCA can show in a visualization. 
The second problem is that PCA focuses on preserving large pairwise distances. Um, so if two things are, are far apart, PCA thinks it's really important to make sure that these two things, these two very different things, have the right distance in the map. Um, and, and the reason for this is that you can think of maximizing variance as you know, minimizing some kind of like squared, um, squared error on distances. Right? And so what that means is that in the map I just showed you, that PCA really cares about making sure that the zeros have the right distances uh, from the ones, right? That they're the right distance apart, that the distance that you see in the map accurately reflects how far apart zeros and ones are in this high dimensional pixel space. And in a lot of cases, that's really not what you're, what you're interested in, right? It's like if you look at a visualization, as long as you can tell that zeros are things that are different from ones, you're, you're probably okay. And you don't care much about, um, about getting those distances um, mapped accurately in your, um, in your visualization. And one of the reasons um, for that is, is what I'm showing here. So for instance, if your data lies on, your high dimensional data lies on um, some structure that is not linear. So that has like this weird um, um, curvy structure, then actually large distances are not really things that are very informative. Right? Because the, the distance between the two points, um, the Euclidean distance would be measured by you know, measuring the length of the dashed line, but really you know, sort of the, the, the distance of these two points should be more interpreted as the, the distance or the length of the, um, of the solid line. Right? And so typically in, in high dimensional spaces, these large distances um, are, not very, are not very informative either. Right, so like if you think about your data in terms of one of these uh, curved structures, then really only the the only um, um, the only distances that are informative are the distances between a point and its nearby neighbors, right? Because those things are yeah, yeah you know those things are are going to be um, sort of the same, right? Like irrespective of what the structure of the um, um, of the high dimensional data is. And so in TSNI, what we're trying to do is like, rather than focusing on preserving large pairwise distances, we're going to try and preserve small distances only. Um, and here's how we do it. So in, in the high dimensional space, uh, what we do is um, we take a data point. So this is the, uh, the red block here. And we center a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian bell curve over it. Um, so this is the red circle. And now what we're going to do is we're going to measure the density of every other point in this high dimensional space under this Gaussian bell curve. Um, and that's the, the, the top part of the fraction you see in, in the bottom, right? And so what, these, um, what this um, gives you is it gives you a high value for points that are close to the red, um, to the red block. And it gives you basically a zero density for points that are far away. Right, that are not sort of under uh, under the circle that don't sit in them, in the mode of that um, of that Gaussian bell curve, right? And so what this gives us are similarities um, that we will call PIJ, and these similarities so they capture the similarity between high dimensional data points. The similarities are large when two data points in the high dimensional space are close together, and they're zero when these two data points are are far apart, right? So what we have now is a characterization of the sort of the local structure of the high dimensional data, right? We've sort of measured all the nearby distances and we've discarded everything else. Okay, so this is in the high dimensional space. Now in the low dimensional space, we're going to do something very similar. So in the low dimensional space, right? We're going to have a, uh, a two dimensional point um, for each of the high dimensional, um, each of the high dimensional inputs. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to do the same thing. So we're again going to center a distribution over the, um, over the red block. And we're going to measure the density of all the other points in the two dimensional space under that distribution. Um, and this gives us another measure of, um, of similarity, which here we call QIJ. Right, so PIJ was measuring local similarities in a high dimensional space. 
and QIJ is measuring local similarities in, in the low dimensional space. Now, the only thing that we changed here is that we're not using a Gaussian kernel to, um, um, to measure similarity in this low dimensional space, but we use a student T kernel. Um, and so for those of you who remember sort of your statistics 101, right? Like the, the T distribution, it kind of looks very similar to a Gaussian kernel, but it's much more heavy tilt. And it turns out that sort of using this heavy tilt distribution leads to, to much better results in, in practice. Okay, so now what we have, right? We have a way to measure high dimensional similarities, um, input similarities, um, which are these PIJ values. We have a way to measure similarities, local similarities in the map, which are these QIJ values. Now what we want is we want to arrange the map in a way that the QIJ values are very similar to the PIJ values, right? Um, and so the way we're going to do that is by basically minimizing the, the similarity between these two, um, these two probability distributions, these PIJ probabilities in the, high, in the original space and these QIJ probabilities in the, in the low dimensional space. Um, and the, the distance measure that we use is something called a kullback leibler divergence, which is sort of the natural distance measure between, um, between um, uh, distributions, but it's also something that, we, that makes a lot of sense for the goal that we have, right? Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Now what we do is we're basically, we're going to move around the points in the low dimensional space in order to try and get a configuration that that minimizes the distance between this PIJ and this QIJ probability. So between the similarities in, in the, the high dimensional and the low dimensional space. So why do we use this function? Why do we use this kullback leibler divergence? So if you look at it, so it has this form, it, it is PIJ log PIJ over QIJ. So let's consider first a case where I have two data points that are very close together, that are very similar in the, in the original input data. So then what I have is I'll have a large PIJ value. So I have a large PIJ value um, times the log of a large PIJ value divided by something else. So then I better make sure that the QIJ value is also large because if the QIJ value is small, then I divide a large value by a small value. So that's going to be an even larger value I take a log and I multiply by another large value, right? And so I'll pay a large price in terms of this Kullback library divergence. So if I have two similar points in the original input, then I better make sure that these points are also close together in, um, um, in the two dimensional output in the map that I'm, um, I'm creating. Um, and so what this is really, what this minimizing this loss is really doing is it's making sure um, that we're trying to preserve only local structure um, in the map. And we explicitly sort of don't care about, um, about the larger distances. The other aspect of it is this student T distribution. Um, like why, you know, why didn't we use a Gaussian to measure similarities in this, in this two dimensional map? And it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the heavy tail distribution is correcting for volume differences between, um, uh, between the high dimensional and the low dimensional space. And this is a little bit of a, of a complicated argument, but the idea is like this. If you have data in a high dimensional space and you try to map it down in a lower dimensional space while preserving local distances, then the larger distances, they have to be modeled by even larger things in the map. And that sounds really complicated, but I can illustrate it with a very simple example where I have just three data points. And these three data points live in a two-dimensional space. And I'm going to try and, and map this two-dimensional space down to one dimension. Um, and um, I'm going to do it in a way that preserves the small distances. And the small distances here are the red rods. So I can do that. Um, you know, I can do that perfectly, right? This is a perfect map of the a one-dimensional map of the two-dimensional local structure. But look what happened in the process. In the process, the difference between, you know, the first and the third points became, you know, two rather than square root two, right? And so that distance became 
um, became larger. Um, and so what is, what is happening if you, were, if you were to use a Gaussian kernel to measure similarity in the map is you would have all these points that actually, you know, all these, um, all these um, uh, points that are, that are different, uh, that are far apart in the original data that actually want to be closer together. And what the T distribution is doing is, is basically saying, well, you don't have to worry about that. Like it's okay. What it's doing is if two points are, uh, are dissimilar, you know, so they have, let's say a distance of 10 in the original data, and that gives them a density of 0.01 under the Gaussian, then under the student T distribution to get that same density of 0.01, the, the data points can, can have a distance of 20 apart in them in the map. Right, so it's explicitly sort of saying, you know, things that are different, you can model as too far apart in the map. Uh, and it turns out that's a really good thing. So what you're looking at here is um, sort of running a TSNE optimization on the same data. Um, and and so, so really sort of the way the optimization works is it's literally moving around the points to try and find configurations of the map that minimize this, this kuhlberg leibler divergence, right? So that minimize this difference between PIJ and, and QIJ values. Um, and you see a lot of structure forming when you, uh, when you do this and you see that qualitatively it leads to a very different um, map than, P than PCA produced. Um, and you can sort of, you know, because these are digit images, right? Like you can sort of zoom in and, and look at what, what, is actually, uh, what is actually being captured here. And then what you see is that there's a lot of local structure that's being captured in this map, right? Um, so for instance, for zeros, it's capturing the fact that they're round zeros and these more elongated ones. Or it's capturing the fact that four sevens and nines are, are sort of similar and have a particular orientation. And there are even some uh, digit images that sit in between the fours and, um, and nines, you know, because they're, it's kind of unclear where they, uh, where they fit, right? But keep in mind the, the algorithm is fully unsupervised, right? So it doesn't know anything about digit images and it doesn't know anything about the, um, about the classes. Um, so Armand is asking what optimization method is, is being used uh, by TSNE. So, so it's basically a standard gradient descent um, optimization method. Although there are, um, in order to make it efficient, there are um, um, optimizations that you that you need to do. One of the one of the limitations or downsides of TSNE is that you have to consider all pairwise interactions between the data points. So if you have n data points, you have n squared interactions, um, and there are so there are a lot of efficient approximations to make this you know order uh, order n log n rather than order n squared. Uh, but the basic algorithm is a gradient descent algorithm, you know, that minimizes the kuhlbeck leibler divergence with respect to the locations of the points in the map. Um, Jaime is asking uh, whether I'd recommend using PCA as an, as an initialization step. Uh, I would not. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that doesn't work. For, for TSNE to work, it is really important that the initialization is happening by um, by sampling from a sampling the initial map points from a distribution that has a really small um, uh, really small variance. And you saw that in the visualization I showed earlier, we're starting sort of almost in one point, and this is deliberate. So the initial um, the initialization that we uh, that we do is sort of you know very um, uh, very. Uh, by sampling from a, a Gaussian with a very small variance, and then the map is sort of growing. And this is important for, um, for the optimization to work well. Um, so an anonymous attendee is asking whether TSNE works with distance metrics like Hamming as compared to Euclidean L2 norm. Yeah, so that's a great question. I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, but basically what you do on the input side, um, you have a lot of freedom there to choose um, how you exactly compute these PIJ values. I, in the example I showed, you know, I use the Gaussian kernel. So implicitly I use Euclidean distances, but it's definitely okay to use other approaches there. And sometimes, you, you know, your data may come in a different form. Your data may come in the form of a graph 
or it may come in the form of um, um, sort of association data or, or correlations. And those correlations, they're sort of, you know, these things are sort of naturally already PIJ um, values, right? They already capture similarities between, um, between data points. And so you can, you can play around with that sort of um, um, with what you do on the, on the input side, how you, how you, um, how you construct these PIJ values. Um, so TSNE, uh, does TSNE preserve local distances? Can we then cluster cells on the TSNE output instead of the original high dimensional space? Yeah, so people do that, right? So people run clustering on these kinds of, um, these kinds of maps. I think it's okay. I don't have a strong intuition for whether it'll be better or worse, um, but it's definitely okay to do. Um, I'll move on a little bit and then I get some, I will get to some more questions, um, more questions later. Um, there's still one that's a follow up. So, uh, um, FIT SNE uses PCA initialization and that, that works well. Yeah. So, so FITSNE is sort of, um, a, um, an efficient, a, a more efficient way to implement, uh, uh, TSNE. They, they use a different optimization algorithm and, um, I guess their PCA initialization is fine sort of for the traditional algorithm where you have a gradient, um, a gradient descent based implementation, I don't think it'll work very well. Okay, so, so let me move on a little bit and then I'll get to some more questions later. So what are some do's of, of using TST? So, so the way I, I tend to use it is um, as a method to try and generate hypotheses on, on your data or to try and, and make sense of what's going on. So for instance, in my, my PhD work, I worked a lot on um, um, algorithms for recognition of textures. And I wanted these algorithms to be invariant under affine transformations of the images. And so what I would do is I would create some representation of these images and then I would presentation into TSNE to get an, an intuition for what's going on. Um, and indeed, in this case, it would um, it would capture representations that um, um, that suggest that the um, uh, that the underlying representation is somehow invariant to um, uh, uh, to affine transformations of um, of the images, right? And so, so, so this is sort of the way I would I would use it as a way to to um, you know get a sense for what's going on to generate hypotheses, uh, but not to draw conclusions. And I'll get to that in a bit. I think the second do is like, you wanna be creative as to what inputs you use into uh, TSNE. And I already said that a little bit um, earlier, right? So like in the example I showed the PIJ value, sort of the input similarities were computed by, com by looking at Euclidean distances in high dimensional inputs, which makes sense if you're dealing with, let's say gene expression data. But in many other cases, your input data may have the form of a tree or a network or a graph or co-occurrences or associations. And very often those naturally take the form of, um, of PIJ values, right? And so you can be creative in, in sort of how you define these, these PIJ values. And most common implementations um, of TSNE allow you to either input, um, you know, a high dimensional data matrix, but they also allow you to input a PIJ matrix directly. The, the last thing, the, the third thing I would encourage you to do is to be creative in how you visualize the outputs of, um, um, of TSNE. So for instance, this is an example where um, uh, with, with collaborators um, in, um, in Leiden and at the Allen Brain Institute, we were looking at um, uh, gene expression data in the mouse brain. And so each point here is a, um, is a location in the mouse brain. The, um, the map is organized based on uh, sort of similarities in, in gene expression at that location and the colors correspond to anatomical regions, right? And so this is one way in which you can look at, um, at this data, but for this particular case, there are also other ways in which you can visualize it, right? So this is an, another visualization of the exact same TSNE map where what we did is instead of um, showing the results as a scatter plot, we took the location in the TSNE map, um, this 2D location for every uh, location in the mouse brain, and 
we encoded this um, this 2D location as a color, right? So you can take a, a color space, something like you know red, green, blue, and then you use the location um, in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional TSNI map to determine you know how much red, how much green, how much blue at this um, at this location, and and so we use that to color basically the entire voxel space, right? And so what that gives you is a visualization like this, where similar colors um, um, in, um, in the visualization mean that these two locations have similar uh, gene expression in this case. Right? And so you can be creative in, in how you use the, um, the outputs of the TSNI algorithm. It can be a scatter plot, but there can be other sort of more appropriate ways to, um, to visualize the results. The, the other thing I want to get into is the, um, what are some of the don'ts of, of using TSNI or, or what should you be aware of? I, I'd say the, the main one that I, that I see um, uh, quite regularly in, um, in, in academic papers that I find somewhat worrying is what I would call proof by TSNI. Um, so you, I, I don't know, like in particular in, in the machine learning and computer vision community, this happens quite, quite frequently where people put, will propose some way of processing data, and then they will use these kinds of visualizations to prove that their way of doing it is, is better. And I think this is really problematic because the, um, the maps that you're looking at, they're not the actual data, right? They're a representation of the data that captures some of the structure of the original data, but they don't, they're not the data itself, right? And so I think really the only way you can, you can use it is, um, is as a way to generate um, hypotheses or sort of you know, intuitions about your data that you then test to through sort of proper statistical means. And it's also important to consider other alternative um, hypotheses, right? So there can be multiple explanations for, for the same effect. Um, an example of that, this was in, um, in a recent paper in the computer vision community where from this um, um, uh, from this visualization, the authors concluded that the visualization shows that our method learns meaningful transformations because there are all these little, um, these little colored patterns um, in the, uh, in the TSNI map, but the exact same effect could be created by um, multiplying sort of the, uh, the inputs by a constant um, that is larger than one for multiple values and then apply TSNI on the results. And you'll get basically the same map. Right. And so it is important also to think very carefully about like, you know, what are what are sort of the alternative hypotheses that could explain the effects that I'm um, that I'm seeing in these in these visualizations. So, so that's one. Um, another thing that's important to be aware of is that you cannot assign much meaning to distances that are that go across sort of a large empty space. Um, so kind of beyond the scale of the student T distribution. So beyond sort of the, you know, the bell of this distribution, all similarities are basically zero, right? They're infinitesimal. And so they don't, they don't mean much, right? So in a map like this, um, this is an example map of, um, 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 of these digit images. What you see is actually that the cluster of ones and the cluster of zeros are relatively close together but their distance is farther apart than uh, the scale of the student T distribution. And really this doesn't mean anything, right? Um, and so you cannot draw uh, conclusions um, about distances that go sort of across, um, across empty space. And this is something that's, that's important to keep in mind as you look at these kinds of maps. Another thing that's important is that TSNI will not help you find outliers. Um, and you can also not assign meaning to densities of points in clusters. Um, so I, I won't go into too much detail here, um, but the, 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 the sort of TLDR here is that we designed TSNI very explicitly to eliminate outliers, to sort of pull outliers in with, um, uh, with the rest of the data. And the reason for that is that if you have a nice visualization, but then you have a few outliers, then um, if you show this as a, as a scatter plot, then what you'll get is sort of a, a very tiny, nice visualization that you can't really see. And all you'll see is these few outliers, right? And so we designed it very explicitly to eliminate outliers. And so really you cannot use it as an outlier detection method. 
The final thing that's important is that scale um, or how it's called in, in Disney perplexity, that that matters. Um, so in the, um, um, in the input similarities, right, um, when we use this Gaussian kernel to measure similarities in, in the high dimensional data, the Gaussian kernel has a scale, right? It has a variance parameter. And that variance parameter sort of trades off what you consider local structure versus global structure. And you can kind of think of this as, as something similar to, you know, the number of clusters K in, in K means clustering, right? Which is also a kind of scale variable. And any unsupervised uh, uh, learning algorithm that you use, whether it's CSNE or K means clustering or UMAP is going to have a parameter like this. Right, and how you set it matters. Um, so if you have some, some original data, the, the scale parameter in, um, in TSNI is called the perplexity. The way you can think of it is basically if the perplexity is five, then you could think of it as like each data point is trying to keep its five nearest neighbors close to itself in the visualization, right? And so what you see is that if you um, increase the perplexity that you'll start seeing different structures, right? You start looking at your data at a different scale. Um, and so this is something that's, that's important to keep in mind as you, um, as you do these, um, these analysis. And the final thing to keep in mind is that um, the, the objective function that we that these is minimizing. So this callback library divergence it's a non-convex function. So what that means is that it's going to have local minima. And typically these local minima will have the form of splitting a natural cluster into multiple parts. And I'm showing you an example here where this natural cluster of ones was splitting in two, as well as the, the cluster of fives. Now, one thing that's, that's important to keep in mind is that it is perfectly okay to run TSNI multiple times on the same data and to pick the best solution in terms of the Kubek library divergence. Um, that is something that is, that is acceptable to do. Um, okay, so, so that is sort of what I wanted to, to cover. So to conclude, you, you know, TSNI is a, is a valuable tool in, in generating hypotheses and in generating understanding, but it doesn't pr produce any conclusive evidence or, or anything uh, like that, right? And some important caveats to keep in mind is that you know, like clustering techniques, TSNI has a skill. It reveals only select parts of the structure of the data. Um, and, um, and, and also keep in mind that, you know, certain structure can never be reflected in a low dimensional map, right? Like they're just things that cannot be represented well in, in two or three dimensions that can exist in, in a high dimensional space. Um, so with that, you know, here are a bunch of, uh, of references to, to relevant papers. I also really like um, this blog post that I put up on uh, distill.pub, um, which is a really nice sort of overview of, um, 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 uh, of sort of how the algorithm works and also what some of the caveats are. And you can find source code for all this stuff in, in many places. So I think with that, we, we have some time for to answer more questions. I don't know how you want to do this, Son. Uh, do you want to uh, questions or should I just go yes, over? Yes, I, 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 I think I help you go over this. So, uh, yeah, so the first question is from an anonymous attendee. So TSNE does preserve local distances. Can we then cluster cells on the TSNE output instead of using the original high dimensional space? Yeah, so, so I think I already answered this one. So, so it's okay to do. I, I know there are a bunch of uh, studies that do this, right? I think there's a method called XSense that is basically doing TSNI and then some kind of like K-means clustering. I think it's okay to do. I don't have a strong intuition for whether it's better or worse than doing, um, um, than running the clustering on the original, um, uh, original data. Some people report it's better. I'm... I'm, I'm sort of half convinced of that, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's situa that you can come up with situations where it's worse as well. So I don't, I don't have very strong ad advice there other than that, you know, it's okay to do, I guess. Yeah, also related to, to the, the questions, uh, because in, in the talk that you show uh, that the one cluster can be split in different results, right? Because of the, of the, uh, of the local minima. So, uh, 
that means does that mean that the the pawns that are closed in high dimensional space and in when we reduce to low dimensional space can they still be very far away um sorry can you can you say that again so in in in, in, in some of your slide you show that one cluster mm -hmm. are split in two parts yeah in the Disney does it mean does it mean that the 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 pawns that are very close in high dimensional space and then in two dimensional space they, they're becoming very far yeah, yeah so in that example right it's like that happens right and so yeah you know and i think that's what i mean by um yeah you know it, it's never going to be a perfect um characterization of um of your data right like there are local minima and they typically take this form right now, I think in, in general, it is the case that, you know, if you run the algorithm a bunch of times on, on the same data and you pick the best solution, then you'll see very few of those. Um, mm. But it can definitely, um, it can definitely happen. Like basically what happens is that early on in the optimization, the cluster gets split into two parts, some other cluster moves in between, and now it, it doesn't know how to get these these two matching, these two uh, clusters that, you know, have to be together, how to get those those close together. Okay. It's something that you can see. So you can look at, um, you know, the, this Kubeck library divergence is a sum over all data points. So you can look at the Kubeck library divergence for each individual data point. And so what you'll see is that for these points, you, you, you know, where uh, the cluster is split in two, that there the Kubeck library values will be very large, right? And so, so it is something that you can diagnose if you were to look at the per point uh, uh, divergence values, then you would see like, okay, these points are just not well modeled, uh, represented in, um, in the map. Mm -hmm. So the next question from Wani, uh, can we use discrete data for Disney? Um, sure. Yeah, you wanna think a little bit more about like what, what you know, what sort of the right, um, the right way to measure distances between uh, discrete data is, right? So it is good, that could be some kind of like Hamming distance. Um, but what you can definitely do is, you know, measure Hamming distances and then use those as input into, um, into TSNI. So, so a lot of um, implementations allow you to either input high dimensional data or a pairwise distance matrix or a pairwise uh, similarity slash probability um, um, matrix. And so I think this is what I mean by, you, you know, be, be a little creative, think about sort of what, what the right way, um, what the right sort of input into the algorithm is. And right. you can even, if you're not sure sort of what distance measure to use on your data, for instance, you could even use TSNI as a way to get some insight into that, right? So you could try different, um, different ways of measuring pairwise distance make a TSNI map for each of them and try to get a sense for, you know, what differences this, this gives, right? So it can almost be a, um, a diagnosing tool in that, um, in that sense. Right. So uh, one comment is that from uh, one of the attendees, they say that the UMAP does work well with having. So going to the next question, uh, would, uh, would TSNE be able to capture patterns and perform pattern recognition in the new in the near future? Um, I mean, well, I mean, pattern recognition is a very broad term, right? It's like, I mean, TSNE is doing um, is 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 sort of trying to capture some patterns in in the high dimensional data in a, in a low dimensional map. So in that sense, it's doing. Um, it's, it, it's trying to recognize some kind of patterns. If by pattern recognition, you mean things like, um, you know, sort of classification or regression, um, I don't think it's particularly suitable for that. Um, you, you know, TSNI is an, is an unsupervised algorithm, right? It doesn't, it does not, it only looks at the data. It does not look at any, you know, labels or target values or anything like that. And so it's, you know, it's not an, an algorithm that I would use in classification settings or in, or in regression settings. Yes. So the, going to the next question, I think this is an interesting question. So um, for unlabeled data, um, the, the, this is from Roy. So he wants to run the algorithm with different 
uh, perplexity parameters increasing for, for example from 30 to 40. How, what is the metric that the use uh, that one can compare the result used to compare the result can uh, can yeah. they just look at the scatter plot or any yeah, reliable so that's, metric? yeah that's a good question so so when I said that you can compare you can run the algorithm multiple times and compare Kubert Leibler uh, divergence values you can do this if you keep the perplexity fixed but if you change the perplexity um, you cannot sort of compare uh, across perplexities right so like as soon as the input similarities change, which will happen when you change the, the perplexity, then, then you know, you're optimizing a different loss function. And so you cannot compare the loss function um, um, values, right? So you can only compare uh, the value of, of the loss function if, you have, um, if, you, if the perplexity between two runs is the same. So, so to Roy's question, there's not really a very satisfying answer, to be honest. Um, and the reason is that, you know, it, it kind of depends on what you're interested in. So, so the way I think of it is like, you know, you could make the comparison with, with clustering, right? Like, let's say you were given an image of a tree um, and you're asking a clustering algorithm to uh, determine what are the clusters, right? Now, in this setting, there are just multiple answers that are correct, right? One correct answer could be, you know, the tree is one cluster and the background is another cluster. But an equally valid uh, solution could be, well, you know, the background is one cluster and the root of the tree is one cluster and the branches are a cluster, right? Or, you know, the root of the tree and the branches and then the, the sub branches um, are, are all separate clusters, right? Or the root and the branches and the sub branches and the leaves are uh, separate clusters, right? Or in the leaves you have nerves and those should be separated out as as well, right? All of those are, are valid uh, solutions, right? And, and accurate characterizations of, um, um, of, the same, of the same input data, right? Of the same input tree, but they, you know, what they change is sort of what scale are you interested in looking at, right? Are you interested in looking at the scale of the tree or are you interested in looking at the scale of like the smallest subcomponents that you can find in this, um, in this tree? where if you do that, then it'll be really hard to identify the tree overall, right? Like the, the, the sort of the holistic thing. Right. And so it really, you know, I think in all these algorithms, um, in all these analysis algorithms, whether it's UMAP or, or TSNI or clustering, you, you're gonna have this skill parameter and there's not a right way of, um, of setting it other than um, sort of by inspection of the results um, and, and, um, and, and figuring out whether that is you know, whether you're sort of looking at the skill that you're interested in. And, and especially when the data are not labeled. Especially when the data isn't labeled. Yeah, so you don't know what you're looking at. Um, yeah. There I would definitely, you know, run it for a bunch of values and, and see what happens. Um, so in medical data, often what you see is that um, um, the um, sort of the largest, uh, the largest difference are the largest clusters are like, you know, different day effects, right? Like you recorded data on different days and um, and, you, you know, sort of those are the, the initial large clusters. And then, you, you know, then you need to zoom in in order to find your, your actual useful, um, the, the actual signal that you're, you're looking for. Yes. And the next question, uh, can TSNI perform with missing data? Um, there's nothing in TSNI that does that. Uh, so if you have missing data, you're you're going to need to use some approach that deals with missing data first, right? So some data imputation approach or define some or learn some distance uh, uh, function that is, that is robust to, to missing variables. But, um, um, and, and you know, once you have that, you can use TSNI, but TSNI itself doesn't, doesn't deal with missing data in any way. Yeah. So next question is, can you <laughs> tell a little bit the difference between Disney and UMAP when people see the uh, visualized result? Yeah, so this is a good question. Like on a, on a high level, I would say Disney and UMAP are very, very similar. Uh, uh, I as well. you, you, you wouldn't, um, you, you know, if you read the papers, you can't really tell uh, because sort of the the mathematical treatment um, of the algorithm is, is very different, but sort of in the, uh, on a high level, sort of uh, the description I gave of TSNI as, 
you know, characterize local distances in the high dimensional space and then try to preserve those in the low dimensional space. That is what TSNI is doing and that is what UMAP is, is doing. And even, even in terms of sort of the, um, uh, the optimizations that go into scaling this to, to very large data sets, you know, some of the more recent TSNI implementations are, are kind of similar. They use kind of similar tricks as in, as in UMAP. I think the one thing where, where UMAP is a little different is that I think it does a little bit more work to try and, and also arrange the clusters appropriately, right? So I showed the example um, um, of digit images where the cluster of ones and the cluster of zeros was relatively close together, which we know isn't true in the, um, in the original um, inputs, right? We know that from the PCA plots. And so UMAP has a tendency to do a bit better in terms of you know, making sure that the one cluster is, is far away from, from the zero cluster as well. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to say whether that's, you know, very consistent um, in, for many data sets. I think in practice, the results will look very similar. And I think the reason is because they're ultimately quite similar algorithms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I think the next question is, um, is there any unbiased way to set the perplexity? No, not, not really. I mean, this, this I think, uh, Jacob, comes sort of to my, my earlier point around, um, you know, how, how you're always going to have to specify some kind of scale at which you're, you're looking. So there isn't really a way to, to set it. I think the important thing is that you're aware that the scale parameter exists that it exists in every unsupervised learning algorithm, even in the algorithms that claim that they don't have it. Um, you know, they just happen to hide it more, you know, sort of under the rock, but it's always there. And I don't think you'll, you'll get rid of it. And it's probably a good thing that it's there, right? Because it gives you some control um, as well in terms of, you know, what data structure are you looking at? Yeah. Uh, is there any benefit of 3D plot and 2D plot in Disney? Yeah. So, um, in, you know, in 3D, like there's just more space. And so you can more accurately capture um, um, the structure of the, of the original high dimensional data. You're less likely to have um, uh, local minima as well, right? So you overall, like the uh, 3D plot uh, produced by TSNI is just going to be a more accurate representation of the, um, of the high dimensional data. The downside is that, you know, looking at 3D plots is hard, right? Like, you, you know, you can rotate them and so on, but, but they're really not very um, um, easy to look at. And so what I would do is, you know, I would use 3D plots, but only if I can, um, if I can show the results in some other way, right? So for instance, the example I showed with the colored mouse brain, there would make a lot of sense to, to start from a 3D uh, TSNI plot and then use the three dimensions to encode red, green, and blue, right? Which are sort of the, the fundamental colors in, um, in any computer screen to, to create the color that, um, that you're going to use to, um, to represent the, um, the, the point in the Disney map. Yeah, uh, the next question. Uh, can we make Disney preserve more global structure? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are things you can do. Like we never, we never, I think, explicitly tried. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you can come up with with ways of doing it, and I think this is maybe what what UMAP is is doing a little bit more of. I would say, you know, my take on it is, you know, within. You know, TSNI's goal is to preserve, you know, small distances to preserve local similarities. And so from a TSNI map, you can make, you know, you can make inferences or, or get a, um, get an impression of what the small distances are. And you should just be really aware that, you know, large distances, you're not going to be able to represent well in these two dimensional maps, irrespective of what, um, 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 of what method you use, right? Like ultimately, like you, you go down from, you know, 20,000 dimensional gene expression data just down to two dimensions. And then, you know, you have to keep in mind that volume in high dimensional spaces grows exponentially in the, in the number of dimensions. 
So it's kind of amazing that, you know, you, that you can even do anything at all. Um, but you always have to keep in mind, like, you know, you're looking at a representation of, um, of the real thing and it's really a poor man's representation, right? There's a lot of stuff that it's not capturing irrespective of the method that you, um, uh, that you use. Yes, so uh, uh, the, so this is the final uh, question. We, I, I think we have a lot more questions left, but we uh, have about two minutes left. So this is the final question. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you comment on the open problems uh, in dimensionality reductions and what problem need to be solved? And can you comment on its future? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I must admit, I sort of stopped working on it after um, after TSNI. And the, the reason was that it's really hard, it's really difficult to make progress because you don't know, you don't really know what progress looks like, right? If you develop a new method, you know, let's say like UMAP, right? Um, 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 uh, which was developed a couple of years ago, then you immediately run into this question of which one is better, right? And it's really hard to to answer that, um, that question, which makes it really difficult to make progress in the development of these dimension reduction algorithms. Um, and that's kind of why I stopped working on it. I think, you know, TSNI got away with this problem because it just worked so much better than the algorithms that were, um, that were before it. But, um, but I, I worry that it's a field where there's a little bit sort of diminishing returns. Um, it's not, it's not fully clear to me that um, yeah, you know, that there's still a lot of progress that we can, um, uh, that we can make, which is, I, I don't know if that's the answer what, uh, that people are, um, are looking for, but, but that's my, uh, my impression of it. So I think, um, we, uh, finish on time and thank you very much, Lawrence and everyone for attending and asking a lot of great questions and, um, Lawrence, thank you so much for. Uh... Yeah, thank you, thank you all for having me and uh, and for for listening. If you have any follow up questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer any any questions you may have. Um, I'm sure you can find my email address somewhere on the internet. So there, there, there's still a lot of questions. We'll send you um, after the after the call. Right. And in, in the next call, in the uh, in next month, we are going to have a more, more biological call. It's called the uh, embryonic tale of tumor genesis uh, from Anku Sharma and Jennifer Pham. All right, thank you very much, very much, everyone, and have a good day, have a good night.